Some say that it's an orientation, that people are born this way. Others that it's against nature and a choice. That's the same-sex question, the most divisive issue of our day and a clash of cultures. Well, good morning, church. It's uh, good to see you uh, this morning to have this time uh, together. Uh, We're changing up the format just a little bit of how we uh, handle this uh, teaching time uh, together. And um, I want to say, first of all, just how grateful I am. You can't come through a worship time like we just did and not sense that there's a tremendous amount of love for Christ in this room. And then uh, to see you so eager for the Word of God is also so encouraging to me and uh, that you're here and you desire to hear what God is going to say and then as best you can, um, helping one another, you want to live that out for Jesus Christ and that is uh, no small thing. You know, there's not many churches um, that would be willing and eager uh, to hear what we're going to do over these next weeks. Uh, to press into something that is uh, pretty controversial. And uh, so I appreciate that you're here. I appreciate uh, your eagerness uh, to hear what God has to say about all of this. And so if you're regular, you kind of knew what you were coming to. If you're um, uh, somewhat regular to Harvest, but fairly new here, if you're not a regular, then um, then thank you for coming, and I, I pray that you would just kind of enter into what we're doing here this morning. If you're a first-time visitor and you stumbled into this, um, thank you in advance uh, for uh, sitting uh, through this, and I pray that God would speak to you uh, through this message for, for sure. So thank you to our guests for being here and giving us your time. As you along with us, I, there are no accidents, God has you here. Um, as you uh, give your attention to, to what we're going to be looking at. So the Lord said to his people, Isaiah chapter 1, uh, the Lord said to his people, uh, come now, let us reason together. And the whole context of Isaiah chapter 1 is God kind of bringing a message through his preacher, his prophet, to the people about how you can most faithfully live for him. There's a standard of how we ought to live for God. And that's really what Isaiah 1's about. And what I appreciate about the Lord saying to the people, come now, let us reason together, is that what we really have is, and I like this word, this is an appeal from God. He's he's appealing to us. It's not even so much when you look at Isaiah 1, it isn't like one of these pulpit pounding, uh, uh, emotion-rousing, soul-stirring sermons. It isn't really that, and we don't even really get a sense that Isaiah was that kind of prophet anyways. It's not even so much that as much as a rational, thought-provoking appeal to the will dialogue. God's entering into a conversation with his people about what it means to truly live for him and being, be faithful to him. So he says to them, let's reason together. Let's talk this out uh, together. And so that's what we're really going to attempt to do in this series because the topic is very serious and, and we want to treat it with that kind of seriousness that it deserves. And so we're going to seek to have a dialogue to find out what God says about this and, um, and help us answer this same-sex question that's before us as we face it. And, and so many of us are facing it in very direct ways. And if you haven't already faced it in a direct way, uh, the likelihood is that you will one way or another. So uh, all of that said, let me pray for us and then we'll uh, start into what we have uh, this morning. Father, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to be here. And we do come to you uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that you would hear our prayer. And as we take on this important and uh, often contentious subject, I pray, God, that you would give us grace for each other. God, I pray that you would give us open hearts and minds to you and to your word. Father, I pray that our wills would be surrendered to you. And Father, mostly I would pray that we would in every way be pleasing to you as individuals, 
as the church in every word, every attitude, every action taken. Father, no one else, just you, we want to please you. And so help us keep our eyes on Jesus Christ throughout this series. Uh, Father, as I said, we pray this in the great name, the saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, as we uh, begin, four weeks, as we begin, let's establish what I think we can all, on its face, I think what we can all agree on. Um, there wouldn't really be, in everything we're going to share here today, I don't think there's going to be a lot of disagreement no matter what your position is on any of this, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement. These are the things that we can assume to be true but need to be said before we look at everything else. So uh, today's message really is uh, just this, seven assumptions about the same sex question. Ready to go? Yeah? Ready to go? Yeah. Here we go. Seven assumptions about the same sex question. First of all, uh, we all, I think we all understand that the stakes are high. I mean, I hope none of us have our head in the sand about this, thinking that this is some minor issue or that this is going to go away in a week or two. Uh, this isn't going anywhere. And um, the stakes are high. So let me break it down really into three areas of our lives that are being impacted by the same-sex question. The first is certainly there's a societal impact. We see this throughout our country. I think we realize certainly here in Canada, I think the same would be uh, true as I read it in the United States and in the U.K., um, gay marriage, for example, and that's only one of the issues, but gay marriage is a fait accompli. Do we understand that now? It is a fait accompli. Uh, the battle for that, the political battle for that is over. And so I think the sooner that we understand that, the better off we're going to be. Uh, we cannot and should not discriminate against anyone on the basis of their sexual orientation. I'm going to look for a few believers just to nod their head right now and say that you agree with that. That as a citizen of this country, that that's something that we ought not to do. We don't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Uh, we have seen, though, we're establishing assumptions, we have seen um, our national culture completely transformed in the space of a decade or two. The, the pace at which um, our country has changed, and the UK and the United States, has been astounding. And uh, not much more to say here except to say that the gay lobby, the movement, has been successful in changing attitudes and legislation and thus the culture. We're just stating a fact that we establish as an assumption. Okay, the stakes are high in our society. Secondly, the stakes are high in the church. There is a significant church impact. Uh, Albert Moeller has written a lot on this. Um, you can search him out. He's written some... Uh, Pretty great things for us as we consider this question. President of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And he just said this, Within a very short time, we will know where everyone stands on this question. There will be no place to hide and there will be no way to remain silent. To be silent will answer the question. And I, and I know that some of you have come to this series because you're not quite sure what you believe that there are still some, some decisions that need to be made, and you want to hear what the Word of God has to say about it all. And Moeller's making the point that we're all going to have to make a decision about this. And so that decision is not just being made in terms of the church and the culture outside the church, but, but listen to me now, the clash of cultures that we're talking about, that clash is happening within the church. That there are those who love the word of God, who worship Jesus Christ, but, but they disagree on how this question should be answered. Within the evangelical church, there's a, an actual fact, a three-way split that's emerging within the church. Let me explain each of these. The first one is that you can be a good, Bible-believing, spirit-filled, a God-worshiping Christ follower at the same time as being, um, identifying as, uh, as gay and being in a gay relationship. There are those within the church who believe that. You can be both of those things. Okay? We have to wrestle with that. Uh, secondly, uh, there are those who would believe that same-sex activity is wrong, that it's sinful, that it violates God's moral code, and that it has no place whatsoever in a believer's life. 
And there would be those who say that if you identify as gay and are involved in a gay relationship, that you can't possibly also claim Christ. Okay, so there are those in that category within the church. And then there are those who are uh, believing what's called uh, uh, the third way. It's being known as the third way. And, and this third way, third way churches, I know about a couple of these churches, would affirm maybe a more traditional view on the same-sex question, but they've chosen to do the exact opposite of what we're doing in that we want to talk about it and teach about it, but these churches would purposely, intentionally choose not to talk about it at all. And so if, if someone who is uh, same-sex attracted or in a same-sex relationship or identifying as being gay is part of the church, they're okay with that. We're just not going to talk about it. That's the so-called third way. All of that to say, the stakes are high, the church is being impacted, right? Third way we're being impacted is personally, personal impact. And uh, some of you in this room are already experiencing the fallout of a friend uh, or a loved one who has uh, come out. Uh, you know the heartache that can come along with that and the confusion that that can bring to a family. Uh, for the one who is struggling with same-sex attraction. Uh, for those who would see their identity tied so closely to their sexuality. Uh, there's impact. We know, you don't have to read very deeply into this, we know the bullying that has taken place of young people in particular. We know how this is, uh, for gay people have been affected in the workplace very often. We know the stories of youth who have taken their lives because of their struggle with their sexual identity. We know families have been torn apart by all of this. I mean, the heartache that's behind it all, we ought to grieve with that. Regardless of whatever position we land on, we ought to grieve that people are so tormented that this is such a struggle for them. Because that, I believe, in every respect, is the heart of Christ. People want, uh, that Christ wants people to be whole and finding freedom and having joy in Him. So we know there's personal impact. And I don't think I need to convince any of you of that very point. So, assumption number one, the stakes are high. Agree? Assumption number two, having established all of that, we also find that the answers to this question are increasingly elusive. I mean, this is a complex issue, and any attempt to kind of boil this down to a couple of simple sound bites, as somebody said to me this week when I was sharing, a couple weeks ago I was sharing with them that I'm going to take four weeks to teach on this topic. It's a pastor friend of mine, and he was like, really? Four weeks? You're really going to devote four weeks of your entire preaching year to this. And I, and I said, yeah, because I, I just truly believe that you can't boil this down to just one message even, let alone a few sound bites, let alone this is the way it is. And so the answers, I believe, are increasingly elusive. This is not a simple debate in any way. The questions that are within the same sex question are increasingly complicated. Uh, ACBC is a, uh, a governing body for counselors, and we would align with this group fairly closely, and they just made this statement about the, uh, the question. Uh, Biblical counselors are ministering in a time of unprecedented controversy concerning matters of sexuality in general. Okay, we can see that. Our society is supercharged sexually. Forget homosexuality. We're talking about just in general. Okay? And we're going to talk about some of that in later messages. Concerning matters of sexuality in general and homosexuality in particular. Now let me, let me make this point by doing this. Let me raise a series of questions that I'm not going to answer right now. Okay? Just to show you that this isn't that easy. Okay, here's some questions. Should Christian parents treat their gay son or daughter as they would their other children? 
That's a good question. Uh, should they meet their son or daughter's boyfriend, girlfriend? Should they invite them to come and be part of the family at Christmas dinner? Should they go to their wedding? Should a male who identifies, those are the easy ones, I'm getting to harder ones. Should a male who identifies as female go through the gender reassignment surgery? Is it okay for someone who is male to live as female at all? Is that even, is that even right? If someone who has had the gender reassignment surgery comes to faith in Christ and they now identify with their birth gender again, should we advise them to go back to living their birth gender? Even if it's been decades of living that way, even if most people would now identify them with their assumed gender. Should parents facilitate their child's gender confusion and allow their daughter to identify and live as a boy if she says she feels like a boy inside? If two Gay Christians have chosen celibacy. They know they're not going to be in an intimate relationship with someone of the same gender. Is it okay for them to live together to share expenses? Is it even okay for a Christian, a Christ follower, to even call themselves a gay hyphen Christian? I'm a gay Christian. Is that identity even legit? I know some of you want me to answer some of these questions right now, and you'll have to wait. But can you see that the answers are increasingly elusive? Can you see the complexity of what we're dealing with as we try to discern what God says about this and then apply it into our contemporary situation? And the reality is people who are part of this church family right here, right here at Harvest, are already facing most of the questions I've raised. I mean, this is the reality. And it's not sufficient for us to simply declare the behavior to be sinful and then to cut ourselves off from anyone who's facing these questions and who might disagree with our position on it. I don't find the love of Christ in that at all. And in fact, in the, in the, in the last statements, a couple of those last questions that we dealt with, we really find the root of the issue. Because generally speaking, those who would say that same-sex uh, activity is sinful, they would, they would address the whole thing as a behavior issue. Whereas those who are same-sex attracted or who have identified as gay would say that this is an identity issue. So it comes down to a difference, a fundamental difference in perspective on how you start. Is it a behavior? Are we only talking about behavior or are we talking about identity? This is who the person actually is. And unless we stop to carefully consider all the challenging, heart-wrenching uh, realities, we miss the opportunity to respond as Jesus responded. And I love John 1.14, and I've been mentioning this verse over and over again in the weeks leading up to this series. Jesus is described in John 1.14 as being full of grace and truth. Full of of grace, full of truth, full of both. And we have to find a way to answer these increasingly elusive questions, bringing both of those things to bear on this question. All right. Two down. Five to go. Still with me? All right, hopefully you'll already see that. It's so easy to kind of fall into this trap, but that the rhetoric that we have attached to this question and the emotion are not at all helpful. They haven't been helpful in the past and all the emotion and all of the persuasive arguments have not, will not be helpful in the future. The reality is on the one side, we've had the gay lobby, the so-called gay lobby, and on the other side, this zealous, evangelical, pulpit-pounding um, preaching of evangelicals. And, and, and that, those two poles, those two opposites, have, have created this situation that's already supercharged, has just added so much 
emotion into it that it hasn't at all been helpful for actually finding real answers. Now, could we agree, let me ask you, could we agree that the gay lobby has been provocative and in your face and hateful toward Christians? Yes? Could we agree with that? You're so quick to agree with that. You know me so well. And you know I'm setting you up with the second question. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the bait. Could we also agree that Christians have been provocative and in your face and hateful towards gays? The rhetoric and the emotion have not been helpful to us at all. And, and so this is really, honestly, the chair, okay, the setup, this is a personal seatbelt for me, okay? This is me trying to dial back the preacher in order that we could come together and reason through the scriptures together and ask the kind of questions in a way that's going to be helpful. And so the tonality of this series is going to be conciliatory and gracious and loving, even in the explanation of truths that are going to be hard for some people to handle. And those truths may be hard for you to handle no matter where you land, okay, on the spectrum of belief. And in the Gospels, Jesus, and it's so important for us to hear this, okay, we're family, we're followers of Jesus Christ, we've identified with him, but Jesus reserved his harshest words, Jesus reserved his harshest words for religious people who thought they had it all together. Hear me, church. His harshest words were for religious people. That's why we need this. This, isn't, this. this series isn't about rolling out the harsh words of, of the Bible on, on why being gay is wrong. That's not what this series is. Jesus had only loving, compassionate words for the very people who, who knew they didn't have it all together. If you want to read something about that, I'll just refer you to Luke 18. Two men come to the temple. One's a religious guy. One's a tax collector despised in society. Doesn't feel like he has a relationship with God. And their approach to God is so different. Religious guy comes up, man, I'm so glad I'm not like this guy. And, and the tax collector comes up, he's despised, he's marginalized in his culture, and he, he comes up and he, he just says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Jesus had only kind words for people who were willing to come with that approach to him. A humble attitude that none of us have it together. Not completely. And then if we, if we realize this, if we can accept this, then, then grace sets the tone as the truth is being made known. All right? That's what we're going for. That's the, that's the tonality. Grace sets the tone as the truth is being made known. And so our fourth assumption is this, the words we use. A lot of what we just said speaks to attitude and approach, but then the words that we actually use matter as well. And I hope that you would understand this assumption to be true. Because with our words we heal, and with our words we harm. And whether a person has identified as gay, or is uh, struggling with gender identity, or is same-sex attracted, and those are different things, a person who is same-sex attracted may not necessarily identify as gay. Okay, those are different things. They may be struggling with gender identity, but all of these things have subtle differences to them that are important. 
If anybody's like that, then they're going to be sensitive to the words, the actual words, not just the tonality, but the words that we use in reference to them or reference to others. I love this verse, um, Proverbs 12, 18. Uh, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Now, I like to believe that if we're the followers of Jesus Christ and we have the Holy Spirit in us and we have available to us the word of God, that wisdom is something we're trying to live by. And so if, if we're going to be wise people, then, then we ought to, with our words, if the verse is to be believed, we ought to be bringing healing, not, not harm to people, not, not rash words, not words we didn't think about, not flippant words, not coarse joking. We want to be so cautious about the words that we're going to be using here because as Christ followers, we have an obligation to use wise and healing words to be gracious in the use of even particular words. Because we're actually on a mission. We're actually on a mission to attract people to Jesus, not repel people from Jesus. And some of us, by the words we use, have become Jesus repellent for people. Rather than drawing them into a relationship with him. Let, let, me, let me continue to, be, to make this point. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 through 20 is the whole passage. But I excerpted out just a few phrases here that are so important for us. Christ reconciled us to himself. I'm speaking to believers, those of you who would say that you're followers of Christ. Christ reconciled us to himself. So that's, that's the first thing. That we, by the blood of Jesus Christ, because he went to the cross, he sacrificed his life, he shed his blood for us, he paid the penalty of our sin, and because that penalty was paid, you and I, who are followers of Christ, now have full access to the Father, the promise of eternity, and abundant life now, joy, peace, all of that, the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We are followers of Jesus Christ, our sins forgiven. Amen? Many of us in this room have identified in this way, and we have received the reconciliation with God that came as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, Having received that, notice what it says next, Jesus gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, now he's saying, your service, what you ought to be doing for me, is going out and helping other people to be reconciled to me. You got it, now I want you to go and help other people get it. And notice, entrusting to us the message So the ministry of reconciliation is actually the dissemination of a message about reconciliation. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. In other words, God's actually speaking the gospel through our lives to those who desperately need to be reconciled to him. You got it? I'll ask again, otherwise I'm going to have to go through it all again. If only six of you got it, we're going to have to run over that again. Got it? We're reconciled to God. We need to help other people get reconciled to him. Now, now, now think about this. We've been fighting to a large extent the wrong battle. We've been on the wrong mission as followers of Jesus Christ because too many Christ followers have confused their kingdom citizenship with their Canadian citizenship or their American or their UK citizenship. And somehow along the way, we thought it was our mandate to keep Canada a Christian nation as if it ever was. But but that's not the mandate at all of Scripture. I don't see that in any place in the Word of God. We're we're not here to create or maintain some, some semblance, some notion of a Christian nation. We're not trying to create what's called a theocracy. Israel was supposed to be a theocracy. It was never a very good one. But the whole concept of theocracy is that God rules directly. We live in a democracy where the people 
govern the country through our voting. A theocracy is God rules it. The whole idea for Israel was they would never need a king because God was going to rule through judges who were going to be communicating the will of God to the people and mediating. That's a theocracy. Any notion that, that we have some kind of direct rule of God over the nation of Canada or the United States or the UK, it's a false, unbiblical notion. And our mandate is not to preserve the Judeo-Christian ethic in our nation. Yes, having said all of that, we're not abandoning the public sphere. Because as Christians, we ought to be good citizens of the nations in which we live. And so, yes, we celebrate our freedoms, we celebrate our democracy, we protect what we have, we're grateful for those who do. We thank God for any Judeo-Christian uh, influence that's in our country. We certainly thank God for the morality that is here and we would seek to protect all of that. We would, as Paul did in the book of Acts, exercise our citizen rights. There's nothing wrong with that as Christ followers, exercising your citizen rights under the constitution of our countries. We should be involved, but let's not misunderstand our mission. Let's not misunderstand that we're actually not first citizens of this country, but we are first citizens of a better country, a heavenly one, a kingdom that is yet to be fully fulfilled. And so we live here as ambassadors of that nation and those who should be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, really what's before us is so much more awesome than what's before any Canadian or any American or any Brit. I mean, the mandate before us is love God and love others. The mandate before us is to go into all the world, all the world and make disciples, help other people be reconciled to God. The mandate before us is to build the church of Jesus Christ into an uncommon community of people who love each other so much that the world looks at that love and says, I want in. Now, if, if you add all of that up, there's more than enough there to occupy all of the hours of every person here for the rest of our lives, just fulfilling the thing that Christ has given to us to do in this world. And that is, is our mission to glorify Jesus Christ, to lift high his name in all of that and anticipating a far better world that is to come when this, these heavens and these earth will pass, this earth will pass away and the new heavens and the new earth will come. And we ought to be longing for that and looking for that with anticipation. That really is our mission mission. And if we're to have that, then we should have, can we come back to it again, a conciliatory dialogue with anybody with whom we would disagree. I mean, if, if we're to be a welcoming community of Christ followers, if we're to have an open door to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, then we ought to be very careful about the words that we use when speaking with or about those who have same-sex attraction or who identify as LGBTQ, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, transgender, gender, or queer. For the purposes of this series then, and hopefully moving forward, we want to speak in the language of the people that we're trying to reach. That's what ambassadors do. If I represent a country in a foreign country, when I go to that country, I want to speak in the language of the people of that country. I want to identify closely enough with them that I can communicate with them as an ambassador of the country that I've been sent by. And so instead of getting all worked up and emotional about all the different terms that are being used, instead of mocking anybody for the terms that are being used, I'm now actually going to engage in using those terms as, as a bridge building exercise with anybody that I would want to talk to about all of this. And so you're hearing me use the words gay because that's a word that they use. I'm going to use the phrase same sex because that's more of an all-encompassing all term that is used in society and it's not offensive in any way. 
I'll use gender identity instead of the now passing away. Gender identity tends to be the more positive way of saying even sexual orientation. That's kind of, that even has a hint of, of derogatory in it now for some. And so we're going to, as best as we can, kind of steer away from that phrase. And some of you I know, you're probably dismissing me right now, Todd has caved to political correctness. And um, if you knew me, you would know how much I'm not really given to that. I am not caving to political correctness, and since I turned 50, I don't care that much what other people think. <laughs> I did before, not so much anymore. I just don't want us, I just want to say it this way, I just don't want us to lose an opportunity for the ministry and the message of reconciliation. And if a word gets in the way, that's a problem. See, the gospel itself, Jesus Christ himself, is described as the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Jesus is the rock of offense. I'm not to be the offense. My words are not to be the offense. If somebody wants to trip over Jesus, let them trip over Jesus. If they want to trip over the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, let them trip over that. But let them not trip over the choice of vocabulary that I will or will not use. All right? The words we use matter. How about assumption number five? I think we can all agree that the heart of the matter is authority. Right? It's authority. Who or what, and every person has to, whether they've thought about this or not, every person has to get to the place where they decide what or whom is the authority in my life. What informs my beliefs? Uh, what informs, therefore, my behaviors? I mean, is it, and, and there's all kinds of choices here, by the way. Is it um, the word of God without reservation? without qualification. And again, for most of us in this room, we would say that, that it's the word of God that informs um, my life, my beliefs, and my behaviors, that the word of God is the authority in my life. But for a lot of people, and as I've been reading on this topic, for a lot of people, it's emotions. But a lot of people allow emotions to lead them and make a lot of both belief and behavior choices on the basis of how they feel about something. That's not a great plan. We know that. But that is, for some people, that is their authority. For other people, it's pragmatism. Pragmatism. You see, because something is, therefore, it's authoritative. Therefore, it's going to inform my actions. This experience, this situation happened now I'll respond to it. It's, it's a somewhat reactionary way of living my life. Or um, tied in with that is just experience and what I go through and I build on a whole lifetime of experience and over that whole lifetime I begin to form and in some respects then I become the authority. My experience dictates my beliefs and my behaviors. Pragmatism speaking to kind of the immediate thing in front of me, experience more the long-term pattern of a life. And, um, and then for some people, and this is very difficult, for some people, relationships trump everything. Relationships trump everything. And so I'm willing to give up on any number of, of beliefs that I have because I don't want to lose the relationship. And uh, we're going to deal uh, with that for sure. Um, it's no secret what we believe here at Harvest, and this is directly from our statement of faith on our website. Uh, sp scripture, this is the last line of our statement on the Word of God. Scripture is fully trustworthy as our final and sufficient authority for all of life. And so for us, it's just really important. And again, I don't know where everyone's coming from in this room. If you're a guest here today, if you were invited here, or you're not quite at this place, maybe you're a new believer and you haven't figured all this out yet, and we're so glad you're on the journey. I hope you can continue to take these steps with us. But uh, we've gathered here today to hear from God and what he says about this. We're going to relate that to our culture and apply it to situations. But we believe what we've written here, that the word of God is fully trustworthy, that it's final, that it's sufficient in, um, 
in all of life for anything we're facing, including this same-sex question. And so the manner in which, and, and next week's message is going to dive deeply into this, but even the manner in which we treat the Word of God or how we interpret the Word of God, what we read and how we apply that to our lives is so critical in this whole discussion. We have to make a decision about what, when we read it in the Bible, we, we understand that it was written, the New Testament was written 2,000 years ago, portions of the Old Testament, or the entire Old Testament, written long before that. And we have to decide, because it was written in a certain context, historical time, we have to decide how much of that is transferred from then to now. We have to find what are called the transcultural principles that are not locked into the culture of the time, but then can be applied today. That's a very important question. Again, we're going to deal with that in greater detail next week as we start working through some specific passages. Now, for sure, those outside the church and even some people inside the church would not recognize biblical authority the way that we would, as we would understand it. And for many, the issue does come down to how they feel for relationship. The final measure becomes experience or the situation that's right in front of me gets to dictate and it's an ethic of the moment. And um, we have a lot to hear about the authority of God's word and I pray that as we move through this, if you're not someone who can fully embrace the authority of God's word, that as you work through this in the next few weeks, that you will be increasingly convinced that what God, the creator, said about all of this is going to give us the final answer we really need to hear about the same-sex question. And I believe God is actually going to speak to us in a pretty direct way about all of that. Assumption, assumption number six. The conclusions we come to will not please everyone. Correct? They're not going to please everyone. Some of you um, holding various views on all of this will not like what I say, you will not like perhaps even how I say it. And again, it's a good thing that I'm mostly trying to please God. Still a little bit of my flesh in there. But I'm mostly trying to please God and not any of you. Um, I think I could say this. I'm certainly not able to be accused of trying to make my life easier by doing this series. <laughs> I certainly cannot be accused, I believe, of trying to grow our church because I don't believe that this series will serve to do that. I believe that maybe today we've seen a few more people in the room. Maybe there is a bit of a stir around the web and I want to listen to the messages initially. But there is a sense in which, as Moeller pointed out in that quote off the top, that there's a bit of a dividing line that is going to be formed here. And so um, this isn't the actual, actually the kind of series that grows a church. It's more, as one preacher said, uh, these series are more like operation crowd reduction series. And uh, so we understand that uh, going in. Um, you know, I would just say that uh, we were just, you know, so elated with uh, our growth as of late that we decided to do something about that. <laughs> Your elders are on the job. I just, want, I just wanted you to know that we are on the job. And so the conclusions will not please everyone. And I take some comfort from Jesus' experience here. And again, Jesus had really kind words for those who were sinners, for those who were struggling, for those who needed answers to various questions of life, for those who were struggling with identity. But, um, but he never let the truth be softened. And after teaching a particularly hard lesson, the subject of which I will not go into right now, but you can read John 6 for yourself and discover this hard teaching that he brought to them. And then the comment at the end of that in verse 71 in John 6, after this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now, I'm not purposely trying to make people turn away. But the truth matters. We'll definitely see that in the coming weeks. And, uh, not everybody's going to agree 
with the conclusions we come to. And then uh, this final assumption. Um, I would just say this. Uh, the time for weeping is not yet. The time for weeping is not yet. Now, I, I know that some of you are personally experiencing the challenge of the same-sex question in various ways. And I know that in the midst of that, there have been tears by you, by others, your family, that you have been broken by all of this. And I understand that I'm not minimizing that at all. In fact, that's not even what I'm talking about here. When I, when I say that the time for weeping is not yet, what I'm really saying about this is, this isn't the time to throw our hands up and go, all is lost. Not, not personally, not in the church. This isn't the time for us just to be so broken about it and, and to feel like there's no hope. It's not, it's not time for that. Um, there's a painting that hangs in, in my office. Um, it's a Rembrandt. It's not an original. <laughs> and it's called uh, Jeremiah Weeping Over the Destruction of Jerusalem. I was particularly drawn to Jeremiah when I was in my seminary days. I wrote a paper on his prayers um, through his book. And um, all was lost at that point. At the point that, that the, the painting is capturing the moment in Jeremiah's life, in the background, Jeremiah sees Jerusalem burning at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon. They had besieged the city. Jeremiah knew it was coming for some time and he was preaching over and over again to the people of Jerusalem. You need to make some changes. The way you're living isn't right. There's sin here. And until we turn back to God and confess that, we're in peril. Eventually his message turned to, it doesn't even matter if you do turn at this point, he's coming. Judgment's coming. He had exactly zero converts over the course of his preaching ministry. No one listened to him. And Babylon came and raised the city and carried the best of the Jewish people off into their extended and long exile. He had done everything he could do to get the people to see their sin and respond to God, but they hadn't listened. And so, appropriately, he's weeping because in this moment, all was lost. It couldn't be recovered. Now, that's hanging over my desk as I'm prepping this series. Some would question the wisdom of having this picture up in my study at all, except it's a reminder to me, we're not there yet. We're not at that point. Where all is lost. I, I love what the Apostle Paul says about this in 2 Timothy 4.3. The time is coming. Time is coming. Now granted, he's writing 2,000 years ago to a pastor named Timothy. He says, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. In other words, I'm going to go and find preachers that help me indulge the passions that I have in my life. I'm looking for an excuse to sin. I'm going to look for people that help me feel good about that. Paul says that day is coming. And what I want to say about that is I, I suspect we're getting there. I suspect that this is true of some people. But this is not in any way so true that all has been lost and there's no longer any hope of us proclaiming the truth of God's word and communicating the hope that we can have through Jesus Christ. Because many still do want to hear a reasonable argument. Many are still willing to hear the word of God. Many are still willing to come and see what God is doing here at Harvest if you would invite them. And so, th this isn't a wholesale loss at this point. Many are still willing to endure that word. They're willing to remain under, to get under, and remain under sound teaching. 
because many are still looking for answers. We've sought to have it as a high value to proclaim the authority of God's word without apology because people have real questions. They're not finding satisfying answers. And yet we hold in our hands this morning the words of life. All is not lost. The time for weeping is not yet because the opportunity is still before us. And we need to be responsible with that. So that's our seven assumptions. I, I hope that at the end of this you're saying, yep, I agree with those. I think that those are something we can all affirm together. Uh, the seven assumptions about the same-sex question. Next week, we're going to look at the six key biblical texts about the same-sex question. There are six passages where this is specifically mentioned, and so we want to give our attention to those. I'm going to work through all six of those in a way that we can come to a better understanding uh, of all of that. And before we get together again next a week we have a resource page that you can access and this message in audio and video form uh, will be on that resource page along with some uh, great books uh, that we have used as source material for this series and could be helpful for you in your further study on all of this. Um, when you go there, you're also going to see um, two buttons on that page. One is to complete a survey and thank you to the uh, more than 120 of you who have already completed that survey after the e-bulletin went out on Friday. Thank you for doing that. If you've not already completed the survey, please go to the website, go to this page, click on survey. It's going to take you about a minute to complete the survey and that's going to be helpful for us. I'll be sharing some of what that survey says along uh, the way. And also a second button there for questions or uh, you can simply email your questions to questions at harvestberry.ca and our hope is in messages two, three, and four that at the end of the teaching time to have a Q&A with me and one of the other pastors um, as we work through some of the things that you're really wrestling with along the way. And let me say um, how thankful I am for all of those who personally contacted me this week and I think we recognize that this is a series probably unlike anything else that we have uh, tackled before and so I'm so grateful for those um, who are in small groups. I had some small groups communicate to me, some individuals through Facebook and Twitter and who texted me and emailed me uh, directly uh, just to say that they were praying for me and for our church during this series. I appreciate that so much. I certainly felt uh, the weight of this series. If there's any doubt about that, you can talk to Cheryl or anyone on my staff about uh, the weight I was feeling uh, this week. And uh, so I would just say thank you for praying for me up to this one first one's done, praise the Lord, um, feet wet and into it, um, but uh, please don't stop praying um, as we move through uh, the rest of this series. You've been such an encouragement to, to me, uh, so thank you for that. Um, why don't we stand together? I'm going to pray for us, and um, we're going to close our time together. Uh, Father, we would uh, pray as that man prayed in the temple so long ago. Have mercy on us, sinners. Uh, Father, we are in such desperate need of your love, your forgiveness and mercy, and you have been so gracious to give that to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, may we, as your followers, reflect who Jesus, who Jesus is in every way possible in our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, our actions. Give all of us wisdom and grace through these weeks. Help us to love you and to love one another more and better. I pray for any here in the room who are not yet followers of Christ, for whom this is all very new. Father, who are struggling with authority in their life, who who aren't quite ready yet to surrender their lives to, to who you are. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would use even this unique time of teaching uh, to draw them into a relationship with Christ, to find the forgiveness of their sins, to have hope through Jesus Christ. Amen.